I'm here in the Peak District on a pretty cold day. Why? I've been asked to look into fundamentals of computing science, particularly in the area of artificial intelligence. I haven't made the connection yet, but I'm supposed to find a particular spot which will reveal all. I haven't got a map or a compass, so I hope the instructions are good. Head for the highest peak in the area. You need to go up as steeply as you can. Highest peak in the area. Better take a look. Ah, that's not much help. There's only one thing for it, and that's to go up. Logical, isn't it? Keep going up and you're bound to find the highest peak. Right, here I go. Hill climbing, in computer terms, is being used in many areas of research and work, including biology, geology and medicine. Radiation therapy can destroy tumours that are deep inside the body. Radiation beams have to be targeted directly at the cancerous cells. CT scans are used to plan where the radiation beams go. The CT scan generates images slicing through the patient. From these, 3D models can be created of the tumour and nearby organs. In this example, it is the bladder, prostate and rectum. The radiation beams have to be focused on the tumour in the prostate and avoid the bladder and rectum. When the patient gets on the treatment machine, he may not be in the correct position. A second localization scan is taken and image registration used to align the two scans to ensure the patient is positioned correctly for accurate treatment. The image registration algorithm searches for the best possible solution to align the CT scan image seen here in magenta with the second localization image in green. Visually, the images are matched when the magenta and green disappear. It is critical to get the best match for patient care. If we consider removal of some magenta and green as a step upwards, then this is the same as arriving at the top of the highest hill in the Peak District. Although the problem has been tackled in a different way, it's still the same convoluted process going through every position and checking height. However, we know how to do this more efficiently. It's a bit like me here, not knowing where I am, but I can see immediately around. If I see a move with higher fitness than where I am, I follow it upwards. Like here, by continually following the steepest upward gradient, I will eventually reach the highest point in the fastest time. It's a simplistic description, but the important idea is exploration of the fitness landscape with two degrees of freedom, X and Y. Well, I've made it. Oh, this isn't the highest peak. Thought it was too easy. So I've got to go down again, have I? Going back downhill is not necessarily a bad thing. Take a sliding picture puzzle. Child's play? 
it's actually very easy to get the puzzle stuck in an almost correct solution. One more move will make the solution less correct. In essence, we are at a fitness peak, but it's not the highest one. Going downhill, as it were, will enable us to go up to a higher peak. Just having a break. Well, I could be here for days trying to solve this. The Rubik's Cube is a far more complex puzzle than the 2D puzzle. Getting two sides of the cube correct is fairly easy. But to get the whole puzzle solved, the sides that are complete have to be broken into. Going downhill in order to go uphill again. But if you don't want to spend hours going up and down, you could always create a Rubik's Cube solver, like a computing student at Leeds did in 2007. The solver was created for fun, as a project, but the science behind it has possible applications that will open doors to that student. The creation of the machine was a combination of three elements all based on mathematics, mechanics, programming and a sound knowledge of artificial intelligence. Hill climbing needs the concept of a hill, a way to measure the hill, and an ability to measure the steepness of the hill, leading to the fastest ascent. It's an area of computer science that offers graduates a great future in a number of areas. But, like all computing disciplines, it's only open to those who know the fundamentals of computing. Understand those, and you'll go up and on to greater things. Finally, I've made it to the highest peak. Well, that was great. Now it's time to make my way home. And for that, I'll need to use public transport. Funnily enough, transport is a great example of how hill climbing can be used in very real situations. We know that people need to get to places. They can walk, drive or take organised transport such as a train or a bus. For the passenger, it's a question of getting to the station or bus stop at the right time. And passengers expect, or hope, that the transport will be punctual and in a fit state to carry them. The scheduling aspect of transportation is an immensely complex and mission critical operation. The key elements that one has to consider when scheduling are the routes of the buses, their timetables, demand for the services, the number of buses that you have available, refuelling, servicing of them at regulated intervals, cleaning, the driver shifts, the costs, trade union agreements, workforce availability, driving and working time regulations, meal break length and location, route knowledge, rostering and wages. Transport operators are looking at ways of making scheduling faster and more efficient. Computer technology is clearly the way ahead. The development of schedule optimization algorithms opens up a revolutionary approach to the complex needs of scheduling. First bus network in Leeds has over 120 services in operation. Uh, they have a fleet of around 475 buses available to cover those routes and they employ about 1,350 drivers. Each bus can cost about the same as an average house and the drivers require significant training. Intelligent scheduling is the best method for us to make the most effective use of these scarce resources. So, how exactly does hill climbing apply to scheduling? If there is an infinite number of buses and drivers available, then scheduling is an easy task. We can easily cover those 121 lead services. But of course, we don't have an infinite number of buses. If we look at it in simple terms, we must start with a working solution. There are a lot of other constraints over a large network that need to be considered. 
think of a puzzle. Every piece has to fit together perfectly. Imagine that the pieces represent transport scheduling requirements and constraints, such as driver shifts and brakes. What if the pieces of the puzzle don't actually fit? So perhaps the driver is not in the same place as the bus. They would then have to be cut to size to make the puzzle work. In real terms, to achieve optimum scheduling and make the puzzle work, workable algorithms must be created, incorporating all of the many complex steps involved. This is quite a challenge and requires programmers who can work with the fundamentals of computer science to meet the constraints in an efficient way, on a good day, in the best way. Cheers, mate. Intelligent transport scheduling is a very real area of hill climbing where major developments are currently taking place. It's groundbreaking work and inspirational for the people creating the solutions. They understand that their work could revolutionise the way that transport is scheduled and that's quite a goal.